thank you everyone so much for coming, especially on this very bleak night. Um, so we are very delighted to be joined tonight by Rachel Brown, who is CEO of CEO, which I will never tire of saying. I love it. Which is Cultural Enterprise Office, if you didn't know. Um, and she's also a convener uh, of Scotland Can Do, as well as numerous other roles that, um, if I mentioned, we would be here all night. So I won't. We'll probably talk about them uh, as we go on. Uh, Rachel is a leader within the creative and social enterprise sector who thrives on solving problems and turning ideas into reality. With a strong track record of operational success, Rachel works extensively to support creative entrepreneurs and social enterprises to develop, grow and scale their businesses. Um, and I know that for me, she has also been a great role model for women in business. Rachel, you've always worked in the creative sector. Um, did you know from a young age that's the industry you wanted to be in? Probably unconsciously, I did. Um, and I think that was to do with the fact that um, I'm dyslexic and I didn't really fit in that well at school. And actually, I also didn't really fit in that well at school because I hated school. And that was part of the issue. Um, and it didn't really work for me. And I had the kind of, I had this sort of feeling that nothing really fitted. And then uh, when I was 14, my dad asked me to roadie for his band. Yeah. So that was, that was a turning point. Now, some people always go, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, my dad was a folk musician. <laughs> and his band was called Harvest. You can tell where this is going. And I found myself in all kinds of uh, bars in Leith and Edinburgh playing folk music. But what was really interesting about it was I got my first taste of what it was like to be truly entrepreneurial. So I don't know if you've ever heard the, the Bruce Springsteen story of why he was called the boss. So the story of why he was called Boss was because at the end of the night, every time he did the gig, he was always the one that went up and said, can we get our money? 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 So the rest of the band just kept saying, just deal with Boss. And I had this kind of romantic notion at 14 years old that that was me becoming the boss of Harvest, <laughs> the folk band. Um, and I realised, though, because I was, no, I was generally, also I was young, but I was generally always the only woman in the room, or young, young women in the room at the time, and I would get money for that privilege alone. Mm -hmm. So even though I was going up and roading for the band, getting the money at the end of the night, people would take pity on this poor wee lassie who was roading in the creative industries for her dad's band, God love her, carrying a banjo, and they'd also give me 20 quid. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, did anyone else have a job when they were 14 that was as cool as that? Because I said, you know, like, that's awesome. And then from that, you decided to go on and study at university? No, I didn't. I actually, I really, did, I really disliked the, the thought of going to university. And the reason I disliked, I did eventually go when I was about 24. Um, and I went for what I thought was the right reasons, because I was, I, I was encouraged to learn, and I was interested in learning. But just about the same time um, when I was 14, um, I played the cello and I also did classical singing. So my rebellion wasn't really in full swing, I have to say. I wasn't like the kind of crazy punk indie girl at school, although I used to think I was. Um, I was studying classical music, roading for my dad's folk band in Edinburgh. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the stuff of dreams. Um, but I got really into the fact that actually you can do whatever you want to do at any key point. And what was really interesting, kind of fast tracking, because it was a bit that changed my life considerably, and this is when I did know when I went to be in the creative industries for kind of forever and ever, I mean. Um, I was 19 and I'd been studying opera, I'd been getting private lessons, because of my rodeo job, I was raking in the cash. <laughs> <laughs> and I also had a part-time job as a, in a fruit shop as well, um, on a Saturday, um, which was great, because then I got loads of fruit and veg and I could take that home. Um, I, I grew up in quite a, a poor household, so that was quite an important thing. So I could also make my own way and bring home food. Um, these are important assets to have. And um, I could pay for my own private opera lessons. So I did my opera and my music training privately. And it used to cost me like 7 50 and 15 quid a week and all this kind of stuff. Um, and when, so when I was 19, I left school. I don't even know what qualifications I've got. I can't even remember. I mean, I've got a few. I must have. You know, they let me in somewhere. Does it matter anymore? Nah, like, nah, nah, nah. Nah. Do you know where the circuits are? Do you know what I'm saying to tell you? Um, I used to lie about it and say I had five Bs, but I knew that I don't have five Bs. I knew I don't have five Bs, but you know what I've got. And um, I, was in, I was 19 years old and I'd done all my opera singing and I realised that opera wasn't really for me. I wasn't okay. that floaty. I didn't kind of walk around screaming <laughs> all day long, which is what opera singers do. 
And then he also had to fight for work, and I wasn't really into the fighting for work. This seemed a bit crass. So I took a job in the prison. <laughs> and <laughs> made sense. It, why would you not? Why and not? Um, I was teaching opera to young boys in prison. And nobody wanted to be there. Uh-huh. Nobody wanted to be there. Nobody wanted to listen to me. Nobody wanted to learn how to do opera. Um, and I remember going home for the first time, and it's a complete disaster. I went home for the first time, and I was like, Dad, what am I going to do? Nobody's listening to me. And he was like, you're in Poland, honey. <laughs> <laughs> teaching, you know, that's 19, teaching young men who are not that much um, older and younger than you. I think you've had quite a privileged life. Get out of yourself. So he, you know, he said to me, this is your first leadership lesson, and you need to think this is about you, not about them. They don't have the skills to understand you, and that is your problem. You have to make that fixable. So I went back in, and week after week, you know, people were shouting at me and screaming at me. And when you're in the prison, obviously you're there. You go in the door, and you're not getting out till you're allotted to time. So I couldn't go anywhere. It's not as if you can run and hide in the toilets and give yourself five minutes to calm down and go back out again. Mm-hmm. That doesn't really happen. So I had to find a way through it. And to cut a long story short, I am. Um, I used to DJ a bit, and um, that's what you do, right? This is what you do when you're not successful at school. And um, I used to DJ a bit, so I thought, actually, what I'll do is I'll take in some DJ equipment, mm-hmm. I'll take in some tracks and some records, and I will sing opera over the top of them. We'll do some happy hardcore, we'll kind of get the thing going, and I'll sing over the top of it. That's kind of cool. And the boys totally loved it. They yeah. totally loved it. We did DJ, we did scratching, we were singing. You know, like we would just do mad stuff. Like I'd be like, you know, sort of hanging off a wall, trying to get an echo and bouncing the sound off everything. And so then we did things like how you go to from Rachmaninoff to Nirvana. How do you do happy hardcore in a hip hop? What are the messages within all of those tracks and all that type of thing? Brought them in about a public enemy. Did a bit of nonsense around that. And um, th- totally completely changed and the bit that changed my life was we did a Christmas concert and um, I, because I because I'd only done classical singing my repertoire at the time was really crap so I could only teach them hymns and, and carols and really kind of four part harmonies in Latin and I was just thinking about it now it's just like I don't know why I even I kept, come on come on this is really great and they were like fuck up <laughs> and then um, we're going to get laughed at with Cho, so they kept saying, Hey Cho, they're going to laugh at us. And then um, we practiced and practiced and practiced, and we went into the, into the hall to do our gig, mm-hmm. and the boys were absolutely terrified. They were completely terrified, and they stuck to me like glue. And over the course of kind of the 8, 10, 12 weeks I've been working with them, I've been going home every night and saying to my dad, What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he kept saying to me, Open your eyes, open your eyes, open your eyes. And so I noticed that the boys stuck to me like glue, and they were really worried what their friends were going to say. And we got on stage, I'm like, I'll be fine, just blame me, it'll all be fine. And the bit that changed my life was, they sang, and they brought the house down. The place went mental. And they were singing, like, god-awful songs about the Virgin Mary in Latin. (laughs) And then the place went completely crazy, and those boys just stood a little taller. Their heads went up, and they looked, their peers... I'm going to cry. They looked their peers in the eye and they, they were transformed. And I just went, do you know what? I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. And that, for me, is what leadership and entrepreneurship is really all about. That's awesome. I didn't know any of that. And that's just, like, <laughs> such a cool story. Um, so how did you go from teaching boys in prison opera to the Soul Tower Fellowship Programme? So fast forward like 15 years, so pretty simple really. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a big believer in you just, you, you grasp things. You should always listen to truly listen. And I think one of the challenges that people have is that they've got something in their mind, they stick with it come hell or high water, and they're not really as self-aware as they could be. And if you listen to truly listen, things start to materialize and things start to really happen. I've been really privileged in working in an organisation and leading an organisation and having a fabulous team of people and doing loads of fabulous things in the creative industries and and, uh, community arts world for about 15 years. And I realised that there was one day I went in and I'd overstayed my welcome. And I'd overstayed my welcome by about five years, probably. (laughs) 
And it was that thing where you go, actually, I can do this, but am I really, do, I, do I really have the hunger down in here for it? Really, do I really? Can I just put this How yeah. did you know that you'd overstayed your welcome? Like, what was the telltale sign that actually this, I've been here too long, this isn't right for me anymore? Things that you would say to people and they'd go, that's really exciting, and you'd go, yeah. <laughs> you know? Things that you would, you would comment on, people would go, really? And you'd go, no, no, no. And it was just like, <sighs> and at that kind of moment where you, you get to the point where everything's very familiar. And the thing that really um, hit home for me was the familiarity made me lazy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a lazy person by nature. And everything else in my life was becoming quite fast, but my job and my work was quite lazy. And I'm, I'm very much a whole or nothing kind of person. So, you know, I, I bring my whole self to work. I'm identified. One of the reasons it looks like I do so much is because that's actually my whole life. Like, everything I do is part of, it's not just a job. And we can all have that. And, I, and I'm very, very privileged. I'm, I do not take for granted that the way that I think about my life and my work is one thing. Um, not everybody has that, that opportunity and I, th I think we should all have that, I think we should strive to give as many people the freedom of that opportunity as possible. Um, so I, I have that and I think it's because at a very young age I was, I was enabled to take risks and I was told those risks were okay and I was told if I failed I had to get on it myself and, and do something about it. It wasn't anybody else's fault if I'd failed. Um, and I, I grew up in Leith. I'm a Hibs fan, so I'm used to endless disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> endless risk, sitting six everywhere. Oh, there's six. Where are you? Oh, there's six. No matter what we go, oh, there's six. <laughs> and um, I was used to kind of having to think about solutions all of the time. And I think that, that if, if, you're, if you're in an environment where you're allowed to be constantly creative, you will always be. I think we've all got it. Like, if, if everybody in this room, if I said we were going to do a single lesson, probably 80% of the room would be like, I can't sing. And I'd be like, lies. It's <laughs> lies. Everybody has a voice, which is whether you've been in, in, sort of enriched enough to unleash it. Um, so I knew that because there was no fire in the belly, and actually, you know, I had a million pounds target to bring in every year. Yeah. 60 staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, 3,000 people doing awesome things. Yeah. And I was like, nah. That's not cool. And actually, there were people who were much better than me. Obviously, first rule of anything you do is surround yourself with people who are better than you. That's a given. Don't ever get too obsessed with your own story. That is a given. You know, make sure that everybody around you is fabulous and they know you're fabulous. Uh, sorry, they're fabulous. Not really fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> <gasps> I that. Um, and I just thought, you know, I need to do something else. And also then I had I had a baby. And then it's an interesting story as well, because when I had my, my first child, um, everybody went, oh, now you're going to settle down. And I was like, what? what does that even mean? So I wasn't married to anything. I had the cats, houses, men, you know, I was like, I had a baby. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> they're like, now you're going to settle down. And I was like, why would I do that? And then I got pregnant really quickly again. And so when I went back to work, everybody was like, you got pregnant the last time you left. <laughs> And I was like, uh, I've got one man now. And, um, <laughs> the, and it really bugged me, and it really bugged me from a female leadership point of view that everybody assumed, because I was now mum, everybody calls you mum. If, any, if anybody does have, anybody is a mum in the audience, you'll know that you stop becoming who you are, and people start referring to you, how's mum? I'd be like, my mum's in Aberdeen. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, I'm just fine. Um, you know, how are you? How's mum? How's mum? And it's just got really irritated by the, the, the repetitive nature of the stereotypes that people had of you. So I decided, I met somebody from Salter Fellowship, um, and then I met Sandy Kennedy, who, and I said this, I quoted Sandy before and I said, I'll see it, so I'm going to do it. Sandy Kennedy said, we'd love you to come on the fellowship, we don't have anybody creative, it'd be really good, but I think your kids would be a distraction. They can't come in. I know. Oh. So I was like, nah, mate, they're all right. So what I did was, I jacked in my job, remortgaged my house, took out three credit cards, and said to my husband, oh, I've been given a great opportunity in Boston. <laughs> I don't think it was my husband at the time, I can't remember. Anyway, um, I said, I said, we leave in two months. Details. 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 I said, we leave in two months, and he said, are you getting paid? I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not getting paid. The credit cards are paying us. <laughs> And um, I jacked 
back to Owen and went to Boston and um, I spent nine months uh, being a solitary fellow. And once again, you know, changed my life and lots of these moments where you grasp them, they do change your life. Um, I, re I realised I was actually really quite good at some things in Boston. Um, my family was with me. We had a completely um, crazy entrepreneurial experience. My little girl, who's now seven, um, she wants to start her own business. She's totally focused on that. She can't, she's a bit of a nightmare, actually. She's got a rucksack with business books in it. And, um, <laughs> shall we, uh, apologies to anybody. See if she joins the youth parliament. I failed. And, <laughs> And um, so she kind of does all that stuff, and uh, you know, my little boy, he's he's hilarious. He too wants to leave school to be an entrepreneur. So this kind of like mindset, I think, is rubbed off on them in a good way. I mean, they're slightly ar anarchic, but actually, I think you need to encourage that up to the point where you can also start introducing the discipline that goes with it. Because if you think about where people are in their own business life, and I spend a huge amount of time supporting businesses. Everything that you have instinctively when you're seven, you're eight, you're nine, you're ten years old, and that level of creativity and that level of adaptability, you get told, you get trained out of you, and then you're in, you, you're 25, you're 30, you're 35, you're 40, you hit these obstacles in your life where you might have to make big decisions about closing the business down, you might have to make big decisions about making people redundant, you might have to make big decisions about whether you you sign the agreement to exclude the partner that you founded the business with or not. And you lose, you know, you, you get more fearful. It's a bit like climbing a tree. When you're seven, you're up the tree. But, you know, when you're you're kicking 50, you're like, ah, do you know, I might hurt my toe. And I don't know if I'm ready for that. I've got other things going on in my life. And so I think that it's important to kind of keep those those behaviours alive. Um, and that's what, when I, when I, when I was a sort of fellow, that, that's what it taught me. And it taught me to take the risk with my family, and it taught me to take the risk um, with my own abilities, especially as a woman. And I always say this, and it's one of these things that's never very Scottish, certainly not what female leaders say, um, but it's good to be ambitious, and it's good to be aspirational, and it's good to believe in your own talents and take them forward. Um, and I think there's certain behaviours that women are expected to be like in the leadership position, that then you get criticised for it, that men don't. And I think if you've not heard Mark Logan's TED talk on why women can't yes. lead, I would encourage you all to, to, to listen to it. Wow, I feel like we were on a journey with that. Sorry, sorry. I, I loved it. Um, I'm, I have so many questions, but okay. I'm going to stick to the ones that yes. we, because we could go off on tangents here. Um, so I feel that you were kind of taught resilience from a young age, but is that something they taught you at Babson as well? Um, or is it just something that you've had instilled in you since you were, were young? I don't know. I think you can learn these things. I, d I, don't, I don't think... Um, I think you learn these things through knocks and bumps and scrapes and scratches. Um, and I think, you know, I don't take things far too seriously, but I also think really, really deeply about the decisions that I make. And I always want to go to bed at night knowing that if I can sleep well, I've made the right decision. You you inevitably have to make decisions that are difficult, no matter what kind of position that you're in. Um, and I think if you can do that with authenticity and with real kind of humanity, then you can feel good about yourself. You should always feel sick about some things, though. Um, so my mum used to work for Bernardo's, and she'd been doing this job for two years, and she worked with very vulnerable young people. And she had a case once that didn't shock her as much as it should have. And she came in and she said, I've quit my job. This is maybe a theme. <laughs> a theme in my life. This is why we I grew up poor. Um, <laughs> a theme. And, uh, you know, she said, I, I, actually, I should be appalled by that. And I'm now sanitised to it. So time for me to go. Time for me to do something else. And I think I think that's very true. You know, nothing's as... Nothing is as insurmountable as it, it it can be, and also people make assumptions. You know, like I don't have, I don't, I don't, I choose to live my life differently. So I live quite a green life. I grow my own veg. You know, I I I've got a car, but my sister gave it to me. Um, we got a telly. You know, all those kind of things. It's not like people then you go, you've amounted masses of stuff. You make choices about the way that you want to live. So then you become resilient in different ways. 
the point I'm gonna pick up on is why is she not with Telly? Like she's not doing like <laughs> pure Netflix instead? Like Yeah yeah yeah, I've got a computer, but you know the telly broke and it's on the wall and I'm just who can get a telly off the wall? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm looking into my future, I'm not going to lie, I'm just like, yep. Um, I need to read my book for this one. So, okay. you recently tweeted, Yes. Being resilient isn't about being stubborn. It's about listening and learning. It's about knowing that there is a bigger goal and obstacles are in the way that frustrate, hold you back and bring you down, but you keep moving forward. Tell me more about the reason behind that tweet and what do you want people to take away from it? Well... So we, so the Culture Outpost Office, we've had quite a journey, and some of you might have seen the, the other Twitter I today about the Creative Entrepreneurs Club, which I'll talk about. about. Um, and the journey has been that we had some money, we lost some money, we got a bit of money, we lost more money, and we generally, every month, have been panicking about making payroll. And every month we've made payroll, and 18 months, everybody's fed up listening to me going, do, 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 do. Um, and we've been running an organisation that's supposed to serve people now, I was really quite, so, if I tell you this, so you know sometimes when you watch a reality show like X Factor or something, and people come on and they sound and they're really bad, yeah. and people just go, oh, that was really funny, they're really bad, and the person doesn't know, they're not that self aware they don't know they're really bad, and we all laugh at them, and that's terrible, and that's utterly shocking, and the person carries on, and that's just being stubborn, they're just not sitting around and looking out the room window enough. Being resilient for me is about making sure you understand everybody else's agenda really, really thoroughly. You understand how what your decision, you, you might make a decision in your organisation or business, but that decision has what we call a ripple effect. It'll have an impact on the environment, it'll have an impact on culture, it'll have an impact on growth, it'll have an impact on a huge array of things. And if you have thought through where you sit and fit and the ripple effect of your decision making and the impact of your decision making, and you still come to the same conclusion that, that what you're trying to strive for is correct, then you can go forward and dig deep and be resilient. If you get to the point where you're just being driven by your ego, you just don't want to, to give in because he's a twat or she's a pain in the arse, give it up. Just be humble, give it up. Nobody achieves anything through that kind of um, selfish, selfishness. That, you know, that's very driven selfishness that you just don't want to give in and so people that say oh i didn't take no for an answer and i say this a lot i don't take no for an answer and when i don't take no for an answer it's because i thought it through and i went you know what we're right it's not right to take no for an answer when i do take no for an answer it's because i was wrong and i don't really care and that's the kind of thing that that you don't you, i think you learn that over time and i think what i wanted people to take away from the tweet was being resilient isn't about being stubborn. So I'm a woman leader who um, gets called, oh, she's passionate. You're just dead passionate. <laughs> just dead ambitious. <laughs> you know, she's quite the creator. Oh. I get that a lot. Mm. I get, oh, I get this bit, oh, you're a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, mate, I don't really know what, how, what do you want me to say? Do you know? Do you want to get the tequila board or what? I'm not going to for this. <laughs> it's like, where, where do we get these stereotypes from? And I think, you know, talking about resilience, especially when you're in some of the, the positions that I'm, I find myself in, in terms of taking things forward and, and being um, a leader in things, and I don't really talk about, I don't even really class myself as a leader, actually. Um, I just have a really deep, deep passion when I get up in the morning to make a difference and want to see, I, I get a huge thrill out of seeing other people flourish. So, you know, this young lady here, Jude, is really quite awesome and has flourished over the last five years and I've kind of kept my eye on what's been going on and all these things that have been happening and subtly watching her story and it's extraordinary, it's incredible. And, you know, when she said, will you do this? I didn't hesitate because good people, you want to work with good people. You don't want to work with the dead, you work with the living. Um, so, <laughs> Kind of where I am. Totally. But you know, it's like, that's true. People work with people. People buy from people. People communicate with people. So if you're good to everybody, you've got to be good to everybody because you don't know who you're going to need on the way up and on the way back down. Um, I just want to ask you about another tweet because yep. um, I can't remember this one, but it was, it was more about people and what they've said about you and about how someone had called you Marmite. And I just wondered, in those times where 
you are personally being attacked. How do you stay resilient? Because you you, you just always seem so like happy and cheery and you, that you don't care. So how do you not take that personally? How do you be resilient when people are attacking your character? Well, I mean, you should see the person that said it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I don't, I, I, yeah, I get attacked personally, but, you know, I don't get, I, I, I don't, I, um, being called Marmite is not the worst thing that can be uh, bestowed on you. Um, I have had kind of, you know, sort of trolls and, and all that kind of horrible stuff that goes on and, and people want to say horrible things about you, especially when you're female and it's overtly sexual and all these kind of things. And I don't take it personally because, um, there, there's, you know, we're here once, and I'm surrounded by fabulous people all the time. I have a real privilege. The amount of jobs I do actually enables me to spend time with extraordinary people who do extraordinary things. And 90% of people are fabulous. Um, there are people that are quite nasty and quite horrible and, and have real deep issues and feel the need to say these things. They're not the people I worry about. The people that really annoy you are the people that are smart enough to know better. Oh. And they're jealous and they do it in a really conniving way. I don't have time for working with people in business who are manipulative. And I do have, I do encounter that quite a lot, like I'm sure everybody in this room does. Uh -huh. People who are quietly toxic. And that's really quite difficult to deal with because quietly toxic makes you doubt your own behaviour. Um, and my poor suffering husband, you know, sometimes doesn't even speak when I come home. He just pours a glass of wine and, and tells me that the water the water's on for the bath. You know, it's that kind of uh, moment in your life where he's just like, and that's him by him saying, I don't want to know, get out, <laughs> get out of the room, rant in, rant in front of the mirror. Um, so I think, I, I think you've got to be secure in yourself and you've got to be able to, as I say, I think really deeply about the decisions I make around all the, the, the business um, points that I have to navigate and I think when you're unsure you can get really quite worried about people's opinion of you but at the same time if you're speaking your own truth and you understand that you've consulted everybody else's agenda and you know that back to front then you should be confident in your own decision making. So, somebody said to me once recently I was like a bull in a china shop and then somebody else said to me if you're going to be a disruptor people won't like you And I have to say there's two fabulous people that are here, Nicola and Lindsay, who have been supporting the journey along the way. We launched um, the Creative Entrepreneurs Club today, which is a new, fresh look at business support and network support for creative businesses and creative economy and socially driven businesses as well. Because I think there's something in the DNA of creative businesses that makes them innately social. They want to do the right thing. And by the right thing, I mean the good thing, the interesting thing, the human thing. Not the right thing because it looks good, the right thing because it's quite deep and it's quite a part of who they are. So we launched the Creative Entrepreneurs Club today and we were quite nervous about it because it's a paid for service. Uh -huh. It's not a huge amount of money per year for what you get, but it is a paid for service and people were used to having all of our stuff for free, as can often happen in the creative world. You get everything for free and and then it's difficult to value something. But we've had a great response to it, and the idea of it um, is that it's a kind of collaborative network. We share our skills with each other, we put forward what we can do for each other, and then myself and colleagues will be bringing in simply the best people we can find to support others on that journey. And by the best people, we mean globally the best people. We're not, I was going to say we're not fucking about, which probably, oh yeah, we're not. I was going to say, should I swear? But then I realised I swore quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We're past that point. We're past that point. We're, We're not sorry. So we'll make it over there. Um, we, so, so it's not like. 
more money. Um, the uh, we're, you know we're. I, I, I am t I am really part of Team Scotland, so some of the stuff I do is kind of do. Um, I totally believe that Scotland can be the most entrepreneurial society in the world. I totally believe that. I think there is a huge amount of talent in Scotland, and I think we suffer quite a lot. We've got this kind of you're scared to fail because if you fail, you'll never work again, and everybody will lambast you, and you'll be down here, and you'll be like, yeah. Did you see her? She never did that well. Oh, did you hear what he did? Oh to sell his house and all this shit going on here. But equally, if you're successful, and you hear famous people talk about this quite a lot, you know, you can't get too big for your boots. You know, my mum keeps me grounded. <laughs> you know, you can't get too successful. So we have got this extraordinary layer of talent that's operating in the mediocre middle. Because we don't allow people to fail, and we don't celebrate their success. And so this, so this is like an untapped wave of resource that goes on in Scotland. And you go to other countries, when I was in Boston, it took me about six weeks to get on this bus, and I was so hilarious. And these people say, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm at Babson, I'm doing entrepreneurship. Oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a creative entrepreneur. And people go, that's awesome! That's awesome! And I'd go, mm. And you know, you're in the supermarket at Trader Joe's, I'm like, I'm just buying my shopping. I get my messages. <laughs> and, then, and you'd be like, Are you okay, dear? Are you okay, calm down. Are you Americans? <laughs> And um, then after about six weeks, I'd be like, yeah, that is totally awesome, actually. Yes, yes, we are all awesome. Look at us, all Scottish folk being awesome. And it, it kind of, you, you kind of forget that when you're outside your own boundaries or your own country, or your own city, even in Scotland, you know, I, I grew up in Edinburgh and I live in Glasgow, and um, you forget when you're outside your own boundaries, actually, the stuff that gets achieved in the middle is extraordinary. Um, we're just not ambitious enough, we're just not, the structures don't allow us to go further and we don't allow ourselves to, to go as far as we could. So by, by world class, we really hope we're going to bring people that will help change that, help recognise what's going on in Scotland and help us recognise within ourselves what's going on in Scotland. Um, and with the Creative Entrepreneurs Club, you know, we want to get to big numbers so that we've got this collective group of people that are celebrating success and celebrating what each other's doing. And, and actually, really importantly, um, supporting people through failure. Because we don't do that enough. We don't support people in the way... Failure sometimes is like you get a wee pat on the shoulder if people are being supportive. And actually, failure is like, what did you learn? What did you know? What did you not know? What would you not do again? What, what did you do that was about you and not about the people you serve? Because everybody, no matter what kind of business you're in, you serve somebody who doesn't, you can, it's a whole other sesh, um, which I think I'm doing on the 8th of October. Um, <laughs> the, the, there's, yeah, right. <laughs> the, there's something about really understanding your place within that. Um, and so I'm really excited. We do have an offer, though, for you guys yeah. for tonight, so I, I can tell you about that later. Mm -hmm. Exclusive startup yeah. round offer, yeah. so no one else is getting yeah. this. No Valid till 6 a.m. tomorrow. Yes. So. Get in there. <laughs> You're laughing, but I'm being serious. Like, six hours tomorrow, it's gone. Um, you mentioned Can Do. Tell me a little bit more about Can Do and the role. And we have some Can Do people in the room. I was hoping for more energy around Can Do. I was just like, yeah. So, Can Do. Can Do is um, something actually, we've got to really, one of the things that's really fascinating, I think, about the way Scotland works is we've got a structural and political will. It doesn't really matter what your politics are, I don't think. Um, you cannot fail to be impressed by Nicola Sturgeon, um, especially when she gets um, voiced over by Jane Good. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's just like, she's classic. amazing. She's I mean, both, but Jane Goodwin is amazing. Yeah, that's just classic moments, because it's, it's true. And I think my favourite part, I don't know if you saw the bit where. Boris Johnson did that, and then she said, get in your little bag. And, um, <laughs> uh, put your hand in. And uh, somebody asked her in an interview in, I think it was New Zealand or Canada, or somewhere, I think it was New Zealand or Canada, said, um, well, what do you really think of uh, Boris Johnson when he came to Butte House? And she said, uh, you should see uh, Jane Godley's voice. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't fail to be impressed by that. And I think structurally and politically, we have a really strong environment for um, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial success. That's not common in other countries. There are other countries clearly like India that have that in like absolute speeds and they have, they have cool, very deep um, 
uh, programs and awesome things going on. But we have a, a structure, a society, and an environment, and the ingenuity to kind of make lots of entrepreneurial stuff happen. So Scotland Can Do was born out of some of the political will to make Scotland the most entrepreneurial society in the world. Entrepreneurial Scotland, which is a fabulous organisation that I'm part of, um, and support me to be a fellow, also um, as part of their strategy, wants Scotland to be the most entrepreneurial society in the world. And the idea of Ends Can Do is that we have a group of people, I think there's 60 odd partners, that come together every quarter, that talk about, debate, um, corral, share, collaborate around how do we actually do that? How do we actually make Scotland the most society, entrepreneurial society in the world? What do we need to do? We need to do collective impact, and that is about our, all of us coming together to understand the sum of our parts and how we can create um, impact jointly. We need to do things like a shared mission where we're all geared towards uh, a North Star. For me, the North Star is about being as entrepreneurial as you can. My own contribution to that is within the creative industries and within the creative economy and within the creative enterprise sector and how do we want to see those businesses going forward and how can we help them flourish and be more successful and how can we help them grow and shrink with equal finesse. We sometimes forget that the marketplace is a fluid, movable thing and actually what we often assume is a growth at all costs and actually growth is about human growth, it's about product growth, it's about innovation growth, it's a whole gambit of different things. Um, and how can we spread that around so that more people do it jointly? I'm a big um, advocate of inclusive growth. I like the fact that we have mixed communities and mixed developments and can do places. There's a lot of work around how can we have place based stuff. So I was hugely privileged to be voted in as convener uh, in January by my peers to lead this merry bunch of bonkers, nutters people who are like, yeah, let's do it. What's the worst that can happen? Um, and what we're trying to do is embark on a bit of a journey that opens and unlocks doors and, and lets the world see that, that Scotland's open for business, um, lets the entrepreneurs, like the people in the room, know that we are here to support and to develop and to understand the needs and wants of, of them and, and that marketplace, and also to understand new opportunities. Mm -hmm. Trends are hugely important. Um, we are we're miles behind on trends. Um, we're miles behind on the way that 21st century work happens. We're miles behind on portfolio careers and the way that flexible working needs to come in, into four um, because we're quite traditional in what we think success looks like. So I hope we do a bit of knocking that out of the water with can do. Love that you've brought that up. Going to come back to that later. Um, what was it like to be voted in by your peers? Because I didn't realise you were voted in. So can you just talk through that process of how you got the job? Because I think um, a lot of people would assume you were just assigned. Um, so... Yeah, so the first person, so this is a bit of a thread, obviously. So on the ballot paper, there was no women. And I was like, why is there no women? It's like, well, nobody's put their name forward. And I sort of went, well, if I put my name forward, other people will put their name forward. And then what happened was I put my name forward and nobody else put their name forward. So um, I'm not, um, I, I don't normally do things like that. And I know this always, people always think, Wait a minute, you're quite self-assured, so when you sit and talk about these things, you must you must put yourself forward for all kinds of things. I actually don't, because one, I'm too busy, and two, do you know, you've got to know when you can fit in. Um, and sometimes people put themselves forward, so it's like, it's not really for them, they like it because it's a nice little mark on their CV. I see a lot of people go, it's time for me to join a board. <laughs> Is it though? <laughs> Is it time for the organisation to have you as a board member? Oh my god. Um, so I was a bit like, oh, I don't know that. And I felt a wee bit uncomfortable. There's two other, there's three of us on the ballot paper. And then as we started talking about what was potential, what the potential was and what, what the possibilities were, I started getting right into it. Um, and I was like, I'm winning this. <laughs> so then, um, and I mean that in a really positive sense of humane way, uh, not, not even driven at all, but just like, oh come on, this is exciting, I want to read this, this is brilliant fun. Um, so I worked to my peers, and they agreed with the strategy. <laughs> and we got voted, I didn't win by much, so did I, I was like, with two folk or something. No, there was a majority, you won by majority. There was a majority, it was just made up, it was a majority. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine, it's all very democratic. All very democratic. Very democratic. But actually, what was really interesting about it, and this, this is a lesson, like, see if you get really into something, you get really passionate, go for it. Like, I've always wanted to be an Olympic athlete. It's never going to happen. <laughs> it's never going to happen. Oh, God, I've won a gold medal. 
Would you not? I mean, yeah, but like, I don't know, that just seems like a lot of effort. I know we only do it once every four years, and as long as you, <laughs> as long as you peak at the right time. Yeah, but I don't think it's like you just have to do it once. I think you've got to do a lot of training in other competitions to get there. Yeah, yeah, like, I get that. But that. How good would that be? And I tell you, do really annoys me, because I work in the social enterprise sector a lot, which is referred to as the third sector. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Who was, I've never been third in anyhow. <laughs> See, whatever I say that, I'm now going to use my phone. Like, sorry, I've never been third in anything social. I mean, you might have been. I might have been fourth. Like, everybody assumes it's because you're always first. I might have been fourth. I might have been fifth. But it's the fact that it's one, two, three. Yeah, I don't like that. Why would you put the social bit? The social bit third? Should be top. Should be top. <laughs> you said it should be the middle. Why? Oh, nice. Oh, that was a classic yeah. good heckle. I like that. Yes. Yes. That's, that's the answer we're going to use from now on. Yes. I'm going to take that. Can I have that? Thank you. I've never known a heckle to be so positive. Like, yes. <laughs> good. We'll name Star of um, Where were we? Aye, right, so can do it. Yes. You've got on. You're having a great time. Yep. Covered that. Yep. Um, cool. So I just want to take... Back to creative arts sector. Okay. Um, schools. So I wrote this question yes. as schools are cutting it, but I think I want to be really specific here in saying private schools are not cutting these subjects, but public schools are. What are your thoughts on that? And how can we, as in everyone in this room, ensure that we are still encouraging young people to be creative? even if that's not being um, supported in schools? Well, I think, I think we get ourselves tied in lots of some of that stuff because people, so my, most of my kids go to theatre school, right? Of course they do. They go to theatre school. What theatre school? Uh, Vivace, actually, on the Sokki Hill Street. The Palomine from University runs it. She's fabulous. And um, they're great, right? And, and they love it. And it's great for their confidence. And it's great for their communication skills. And it's great for their discipline and all those things. But there might be people that turn around and go, are they going to be an actor? Are they going to be in a show? Are they going to do tap dance? And I'm like, I don't know. And actually, my little boy wants to be a, 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 a what was he going to be? A gecko. So, <laughs> like, he's sick, he's like, he wants to be a lizard, right? So, it's kind of like, I don't think he's going to be an actor, but any new. Do you know what's really weird? This is the second time I've had the My Child Wants to Be a Gecko conversation today, so it's oh, partly a thing. thing. It's a thing, right? It's good, you're sick, so I do not. You've got choices. And then, <laughs> and then that, sometimes that's the thing, is that people assume if you're going to do a creative subject, you're going to be the creative thing, rather than the creative subject nourishing and enhancing and delivering everything else that it should always do. So, you know, um, I did a great project once, a physics project, around neutrons in your brain and how neutrons in your brain kind of spark and, and jump around and everything. And we did it through the medium of dance. Um, and we had you know, children jumping about um, kind of the galleries, uh, floor of a gallery, um, behaving like neutrons and understanding how your brain works and brought science to life. And actually, that was fantastic. That was totally fabulous. And actually, it helped the children with critical thinking. It helped them with problem solving. It helped them with all of the resilience that you need to have also, the thing about creativity within schools that people miss is that it helps you with negotiation and it helps you with influencing skills. And you only have to just sit and watch children behave in a room. Um, or I don't know if you ever watched that programme, the, the Life of Four Year Olds and the Life of Five Year Olds. When you watch them navigate and influence and manipulate, you're like, oh, oh you really are. Do you know, and you can see it all kind of playing out. If you take, if you lifted some of that up and put it into some corporations or some businesses that I've been in, it's exactly the same behaviour. It's just masked slightly differently because your clothes look slightly different, or your language is not as naive. Um, but your behaviour and your body language is exactly the same. So I think the thing about I think the thing about state schools not valuing it is really because state schools are just in a complete pattern of churning out what the workforce needs today. Not. Oh. <laughs> like being in the dinner hall at school, isn't it? Somebody's managed a plate. And um, it, so you're in that continual, what do we need to do? We've got a sales gap today, we've got a sales gap today, we've got a sales gap today. And so actually the future, uh, 
the development of children is about the skills gap today. We don't know really what the skills gap tomorrow is going to be like. I'll tell you an interesting point on this, though. Um, I know I've, I've taken up too much time, Emma. I, I think we've actually don't really have time for Q&A, but it's time for Q&A time. Okay, I just said this one quick story. Um, we could just do Q&A, can we? Yeah. 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 I'll I'll I'm, I'm just telling you there's time. That's, that, that's <laughs> um, so I, I do quite a lot of different talks with young people and I get really inspired by young people because I think with young people you just learn so much back of what, what they ask you back. And there's been about four times in a row people have asked me, how do you work with people you don't like? And the first time they asked me that, like, it was a young person, must be in their mid-20s or something. And I was like, um, I, don't know. I, I kind of fluffed some answer. And then the kind of second, third, fourth time, I was like, gosh, there's a thing going on here. And when it actually, when I dug deeper and sort of chatted to the young person and got a bit more involved and asked a few more questions to people, um, it seems to me that young people have lost the art of negotiation and lost the art of influencing, and lost the art of diplomacy, and lost the art of communicating in a way that enables stuff to happen, and networking. The amount of times I go into an audience and go, well, I hate networking. And I'm like, why? It's just like a party. You've got loads of interesting folk to find out about, and they might want to know your stuff, they might not. But who can find out about them? That's really interesting. Um, and, it's, and I think that's part of the thing. If you, if you lose creative subjects at school, you lose that ability to work your way through all of those things. You lose your ability to influence. Because in creativity, there's no right or wrong answer. There's just your preferred choice. So if you're somebody that's trying to negotiate and navigate and influence that preferred choice, you've got to be pretty skilled in your communication to be able to get that preferred choice across. And I think, and I think that's the trick that we're missing with children and young people who don't experience creative activities. They're missing that critical thinking and the critical influencing skills that you need. And the flip side of that is people often think that's really negative and that's really manipulative. And it's not at all. It's about understanding the, the layers and the breadth and depth of the, of the surroundings that you're in. Um, because if people are, if you think about some of the political climates that we're in, there's no negotiating with that, is there? You're just like, you you think your opinion is fact. And that's not what that is. So um, I was driving Harrison, my wee boy, I was driving Harrison, who is named after Harrison Ford, incidentally. And George, and George Harrison. A side note, he was born on the 22nd of March, which was the day the Beatles launched, please please me. <laughs> and uh, they were the last race or something. Anyway, I was driving him to theatre school, and uh, um, Boris Johnson was on the radio, and um, Harrison said to me, Mum, he's like that man who's like a baby. <laughs> Come. See? Don't even have to say. Six years old. And that, you know, that, that is what comes across. Because actually, he's, he's seen him. He's heard him. He's, he's dismissed him because he's six. Anybody that's a baby when you're six, like, if you're a baby when you're six, you're nobody. <laughs> like, he's like, he's a baby. Like, I'm, I was, I've done that. I'm now a gecko. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like... It's an, it's an insult if you're, if you're six and somebody refers to you as a baby. <gasps> go home. Yeah. Sorry, Daniel Cuny. Yeah, sorry. That was so interesting. Does anyone have any questions? We only have time for like, I'm going to squeeze out two. Go on. Sorry, I've got a really jump. No, we're actually, I, it's actually Q&A time. We're at Q&A time. Okay. So, anyone? Sorry. Yes. Um, Hi. What's your name? Uh, my name's Ewan. Ewan. Um, what's your best piece of advice for like our a graduate like, That's a good question because I think there's lots of routes in. The, the thing about the creative industries, if you get a few projects under your belt, you're hugely employable. So everybody else in panics and says, um, you, um, have you got a job? Oh, I'm a freelancer. <gasps> Are you? Yeah. Like me, I'm paying 40 percent tax. <laughs> um, most of the people that are in portfolio careers are doing quite well. So I think if you've got to be prepared to do lots of different things, and understand the common thread between them. Uh, and by that I mean, if somebody offers you a job to do a runner, yeah, great, what are you gonna learn from that? Loads of stuff, loads of stuff. You will learn, one of the best jobs I ever had when I was young was a waitress. 
Because you obviously need to know about the human condition if you're serving people. Yeah. And it's a bit, the creative industries is quite the same because it's a people-orientated business. The way that you'll fast track anything is if you understand the people around you. So take a job as a runner, try it. Take a job in a graphic design company, try it. The cultures are often very, very different. And within the creative industries, the culture defines the piece no matter what. And it's that classic moment, you know, culture eats strategy for lunch. You think you're going into something, but actually, once you're in it and you, you feel the culture of it, you'll understand how far or how little you need to go. So my advice to you, um, or to anybody, would try lots of things. Take 18 months, 24 months, and say, right, I'm going to do a portfolio approach to the next 24 months, and I'm going to understand it and really good at. If you can, if, you, if that's a choice that you have, um, or if the choice that you have is you need to work full-time somewhere else, and to, 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 come, to, to kind of manage that, think that through. Because the biggest lesson that you'll learn and how people are successful, the best people I've ever met in the creative industries are people that are adaptable, they're resilient, they're really good problem solvers, and they are quick to attention. Because in the creative industries, you can't have an off day. You can't have five days a week and go, oh, it's Thursday at three o'clock, I'm a wee bit tired because it's almost Friday. That doesn't happen in the creative industries. It's 150% all day long, every day. And the, the patterns of behavior sometimes can be quite destructive if you're not aware of it. I think just adding from that, because um, I worked a lot the creative industries as well as that, you know, that 24 months of a portfolio career is great advice, but see if you're in somewhere for three weeks and you're like, this is not working for me, get out. Do not waste your time to be like, I need to get a month, three months, six months on my CV because that it doesn't really matter anymore. And if it's not right for you, get out, not only for yourself, but for your mental health. And, and you don't want to be stuck in something because you're not going to do your best either. So yeah, just know yourself and, and in that 24 months, if something's not right, just get out and try something new. Hmm. Anyone else? Raj? Hi. Uh, good question about the creativity, and I think you made a fair point. Most of us are creative or could even be entrepreneurial. It's all in the mindset, isn't it? Like you said, 80% of us can probably sing. Um, <laughs> But I would actually ask yeah, them, what are you thinking for us tonight? <laughs> so that's, uh, and I wanted to ask you also about what you see as the entrepreneurial trends. And you mentioned like a lot of things that's in the trends just now, but not really yet in Scotland. What, what are those with regards to what? So a big thing, I think a big trend, uh, so there's quite a lot. So um, understanding your consumer, if you're crap at that. Like our customer service in Scotland is appalling and we get really grumpy about customer service in Scotland and actually we need to think differently about customer and we need to think differently about those transactions, we need to think differently about what that all means. Um, not just from a, you know, we have a very transactional way of dealing with customers. So you've got product or you've got service. That's it. Actually, it's much more nuanced than that now. People are buying lifestyles and experiences and, and, and choose to spend their money differently and wisely and they're just not there are, there are people that do that better than us and the people that do that better than us maybe have different sets of values and different opportunities and i think about things where you, you you look at you know we live in glasgow and glasgow you know one in four children live in poverty in glasgow that that is appalling so what can we do from a business perspective to change that we must be able to do something we should be doing something and um, so therefore we have to think differently who is the customer and what is the customer needing and what are we doing around that customer? Because at the moment, I, I do a lot of stuff with um, product-based social enterprises and, and I ask them, so we do lots of customer insight. And I also ask, who is your customer? And they say, oh, it's the Waitrose customer. I'm the John Lewis customer. I'm like, why are they your customers? There's about two of them. <laughs> right, everybody else shops in Aldi and Lidl and Asda. You know, what about Lidl? What about Lidl? So what, what, and we've just got this really, we just got this really kind of almost Victorian view of customer. So I think customer and customer insight and understanding customer and understanding what we can trade, not necessarily sell, but what we can trade is something we're missing. I think we, we view data, um, uh, we need to do more on data. Um, we, we view data and digital as a sector, where I would argue that that's more of an influencer rather than a sector. Every single sector is touched by data and digital. 
So it's not a sector in its own right, it permeates everything, but we get really obsessed with everybody who's in data and in digital, because they're going to be the disruptor over there about that sector. And I've worked with lots of digital data businesses that go, yeah, we're going to disrupt the health service. I'm like, but do you know anything about the health service? <laughs> do you know that customer? Because that is be fine. The NHS is our biggest addressable market. Hi, good luck with that, mate. See you in a decade. Um, you know, so there's all these kinds of areas and avenues that are really difficult and challenging to navigate. And I think that we are behind in our thought process. So for me, customer insight, data digital, and um, ingenuity. We have huge join-ups in ingenuity. This guy over here is doing some really incredible cool stuff, which I'm just going to point out, and then you can network with him later. Um, Dave. Dave. Dave's the guy. Ask Dave. He's doing good stuff. You've got so many inventors. It's just historically one of the best place for inventions, but not so much for innovations. I think people just are not yet at a mindset. They embrace business. Uh, it's a Scottish thing. Like, I, we're just not good at... You can be innovative. Uh, you, you can be you, you can be entrepreneurial without being innovative, but you can't be innovative without being entrepreneurial. And that's the bit that we fall down on. We do loads of innovation and we forget about the entrepreneurial bit. Um, whereas in other countries, entrepreneurs are just getting on with it and doing it all together. And we're not doing it together. We're just, we still keep them separate. We have one more question, which I'm going to take, and then we'll wrap up. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned there about one in four shops and, and four things that we both have to do. I'm from the north of Glasgow, and I do a lot of work there with creative kids. And recently, I've seen kids that are 12 years old and drug addicted, kids that are 13 and drug dealing, to make sure they've got food for their family. It's just awful. I was wondering about the cultural enterprise office in Scotland so over the next kind of few years from your plan because of the silence is anything that's maybe going to be targeting quieter communities that have been kind of forgotten about for a long time? No, totally. Do you know, you're speaking my language there, buddy, because those things are utterly shameful in a city as rich as ours um, with as many resources as we have. You know, we just need to sit around and we're in greedy, greedy offices and all kinds of extraordinary people doing extraordinary things and you know, a mile and a half up the road, um, we've got that. And I don't know if you know the, the uh, Glasgow Cali have done this brilliant map um, within the health population health service department, research department, um, Cam Donaldson's gaff, where you go in a tube stop, and if you go from Jordan Hill all the way around tube stops to Shettleston, you lose 15 years of your life. Wow. Um, and every by every tube stop, it's like a two mile tube run, every tube stop you lose time because of the poverty we've got. From, a, from an organisational point of view, currently we have no plans in the next two or three years, but that, you know, um, that doesn't mean to say we, we wouldn't, we couldn't, we shouldn't. So hassle me. That's absolutely something I would, I would absolutely, absolutely, I would totally love that. Because I tell you, if you, to, just to be, not to be generalist, but see if you're going to navigate at 14 years old a career in drug servicing. You've got a pretty entrepreneurial spirit in you already. That's what I've been trying to tell you kids. I got fired for doing that. Yeah, I got fired for doing that once, but I could tell you that another, <laughs> another day. Um, but, you know, there's something, if you're navigating something that's extreme in, in that in your life, imagine if you could just turn that dial yeah, yeah. for that young person could do something because they're navigating layers and layers and layers. And they're probably getting more recognition, more admiration, and more money than they've ever had in any other part of their life. And that's shameful. But yeah, no, have something for that. My details are up somewhere, so make sure you connect to nothing for that. Okay, okay, guys, okay. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Love it. Okay, yes. I have like a million more questions, but we will do the fireside chat with Rachel Brown 2.0, <laughs> um, and we'll get to that. But I think I want to just wrap up with um, quick fire top three tips for resilience. Go. Make sure you've covered all the bases. Think it through. Don't just get in love with your own idea. People get too obsessed with their own shit. Leave that at the door. Make sure you've thought it through. Um, if one person says no, it doesn't matter. If 100 people say no, it doesn't matter. Um, if the person that says no that you respect the most out of those 100 people, that does matter. Pay attention. Um, if people call you Marmite, take it as a compliment. 
and it's peak. Oh, sorry, I was going to say it's peak. I was going to say peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On so, the same wavelength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all over it. So the Creative Entrepreneurs Club. If you do want to sign up, it's a subscription service. It, it costs seventy five pounds annually, but tonight only it's thirty percent off for you guys. And the code is grind nineteen. I'm not sure I like that. <laughs> but it is grind nineteen. <laughs> You might be the right, wrong person coming up. Well, I'm all for that. Why not? I've had entrepreneurs. Grind's 19, um, and you'll get a 30% discount. Now, what you get for that, which I think is invaluable, and I'll commit to the people that want to do it in the room, I'll commit that it'll be me or another person that does it. You get a business MOT, so you get an hour with somebody to run through all of the logistics, all of the, the ins and outs of your business. Um, all of your cultural piece, all of your strategic piece, everything, all of your idea generation, all of your bit, um, we'll run that through, like you get a business MOT, you also get a digital transformational strategy sesh, and you also get two um, business angel style sessions. So even if you're interested and do your 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 business, the thing that drives me and the reason I would be pushing it is I love to see business succeed and flourish, and it's just nice to hear all the stories in the room. So I'm interested in, in genuinely hearing people's um, stories in the room. So if you want to do that, it does actually expire tomorrow morning. It is a one-time hit. Grind 19 um, on the checkout. The other thing I would say is that um, in how to design business um, in Edinburgh and in Glasgow, it's an eight-week programme. So if you can stand three hours on a Monday night of me, in the east end of Glasgow, um, doing marketing, storytelling, pitching, finance, um, uh, business strategy, what yeah, and things like what do you do when people don't want to pay you, shit like that. Um, networking, if you want to think about something like that, then I'd love to see you. It's a good fun. There's only 20 places. It sells out really quickly, but. Um, if you want to do that, I'd love to see you because it's always better when there's recognisable faces in the room. That sounds awesome. Um, my last thing is that uh, Rachel said earlier that we want to talk about one of the future working uh, yep. portfolio careers. Um, next month's event is now live, you can book it. It's called Multi Hyphen Passion Projects and the Future Working. Um, it's a panel event with three incredible uh, female entrepreneurs who all started their business via a side hustle. So it's something they do on the side. Um, and they're going to be talking about how uh, brand, uh, not brand, a uh, personal brand, uh, online marketing, all that can help. So that is bookable now. But in the meantime, please give a massive round of applause to Rachel Brown.